Major funding for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Last week on this program, we began a dialogue surrounding character and what it really has to do with our institutional business and public policy. And, and it's really more about, wow, it's about the public conscience. Thank you for joining us for part two of the public conscience. Judy, uh, I'm going to start with you when we come back, but we are going to start this dialogue and stay with us. Major funding also by... The Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Dr. Tony Bean of Christian Worldview Center at North Greenville University, Dr. Bill Jeffries of Providence United Methodist Church, Reverend Pat Joe of Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Greenville, Rabbi Judy Schindler of Temple Bethel, and Dr. Douglas Otani of Davidson College. Welcome back, Rabbi Schindler, uh, true to my word, starting with you. You said during um, off-camera, when we were talking last week, we were talking a little bit about, are, are you concerned when you leave Temple or when you're in your car by yourself and thinking, and I asked you if you were worried, and you said you weren't worried, but you were scared? What, tell me well, what that you, means. You said our, our, we get despairing when we're driving despairing, home from yeah. church or temple and we hear the news of the day, and it's not despairing, it's fearful. <clears throat> I'm afraid sometimes when I hear the dog, dogmatic voices that this is the one way and this is the one way in which the country needs to run, and we have a diverse population with many different faiths, with many different views, some of no faith at all, and when someone says they have the answer, it's a religiously based answer and it's the way our country should run, I don't know how they're going to create a society that's going to speak to the pluralism mm -hmm. to all of our citizens, mm -hmm. and that's what scares me. Anyone? Well, I believe you can speak to, to pluralism. I, I mean, I believe there's one way. I mean, you're, you're talking to an evangelical Christian, and I, I obviously the, I believe Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Now, that can be considered to be a very narrow view. It's a view that I hold. It's something that I believe with all my heart. But at the same time, if, 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 you can ex if, if you and I were to sit down and have a dialogue, if you can accept that at some point I'm probably going to express that to you because that's part of my faith. If you, to accept me and for us to enter into dialogue, you have to understand a little bit about where I'm coming from. But I'm not going to come after you or to be angry about it or to be dogmatic in the sense that if you reject what I have to say to you, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re reject you. But, and, and the same thing with you. I mean, I think there are things that I would, as I got to know you, there would be things that you would say to me that I would find to be very different than who I am. But then let's, let's get those things out and then let's move on and try to find, like you said, the areas where we're alike. Well, we're religious leaders, right? We Each are. leading our own mm -hmm. institutions and then coming together to create the best community we can. We can. And, and on, based on policies, it worries me when it is political leaders speaking with that one narrow way, they are leaving out a vast segment of our population and that is what scares me. Those people can't see another way, hear another way, and, and try to find that place You're talking of about politically the way. The There's only one way, dogmatic. political if, if, way. If, if, okay. if I could say here, I mean, the reason I sometimes despair about the qualities of public discourse in politics is that I think that too often reduces to simply repeating deeply held convictions, practically religious convictions. I think that politics is largely the art of the possible. The reason that you have politicians is to try and figure out whether or not it's a good idea, all things considered, to have a pipeline from Canada to the Gulf. 
I don't need to know that one person loves planet Earth and that another person wants to make money. I think that's great. What I want to know is exactly what are the economic implications of a pipeline? What does it mean to have American refiners get more business? What does it mean for the world price of oil? Is it really going to dramatically change it? What does it mean for in terms of environmental studies? And then please give me a politician to sit down in a column and try and figure out whether this is a good idea you're, or not. You're making it tough on us here, Doug, because we, ha we don't have an environmentalist and we don't have a political on this program. And now we're going to get letters, so thank you. <laughs> by, by the way. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right. halfway kidding. Pat, uh, Bill, how, how does this resonate? Well, I'm scared, too. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like Judy. I, I get scared when I hear... But she didn't, she didn't, you didn't use the word scared. You, you Fe used... Fearful. Fear. Fearful. Fearful, okay. I'm fearful, too. Uh, <laughs> and, and open to being edited. Uh, the, the, the quandary that we face is what feels like scorched earth. It, it feels like... Um, in politics now, we've reached a point where um, somebody like Olympia Snow leaves the U.S. Senate because she says there's just, there's no dialogue, there's no give and take. It's all one way or the other. And when uh, Mitch McConnell goes on TV after the 2010 sweep by the Republican Party and says now our number one priority is the defeat of Barack Obama two years from now, mm -hmm. I mean, you want to say, Senator McConnell, is there not a few other things you'd like to do between now and then? I mean, it's, it feels like scorched earth. It feels like they, you know, both sides want to wipe out the other side. The sort of the dream is to have an all-Democrat or an all-Republican mm -hmm. House, Senate, White House. And people, and, and folks, uh, politicos, po po political science people will say, well, that's the balance. That's why we have a right, that's why we have MSNBC seeing a Fox News because they balance out each other. Oh, hold on, Doug. Hold on, because I know you have an opinion. Bill, how does that, how does that? Well, it's fearful in a sense when, when you get into religious dis, uh, dialogue, I think, and thinking that you're talking in absolutes. Um, in our tradition, John Wesley has a great line, if your heart is my heart, give me your hand. And in many ways, you want to see that in the political area as well, where people maybe not get everything they want, but we, get, we fashion something that will work, possible politics, We're trying to find something that will work to get us from point A to point B. And it may not be perfect, but we're not perfect humans either. Mm -hmm. Doug? Well, I, I would like to get back to politics as art of the possible, informed by convictions, but not coterminous with simply the articulation of convictions. And I think what we want from our politicians is, you know, is, is some attention to the possible and the particulars and what can, where we can agree and disagree and so forth in light of their convictions. Will there be times when people have very different convictions? Sure. But it doesn't have to be as frequently as it looks when you get put on cable TV. Everyone has their own little convictional network now that makes money by telling other people just what they want to hear and then pretend that's political discourse. It's not political discourse. It's some sort of like therapy. <laughs> and it doesn't really help much. And then Americans begin to think that that is political discourse, and pretty soon they don't care about the art of the possible either. Well, so I'd like to put in a pitch for the art of the possible in politics. There was a, an article in The New Yorker recently, and I, I forgive me, I can't remember the author, but they talked about the fact they analyzed the par power of persuasion, and the discussion was around the bully pulpit of the presidency and does it exist. And they came to the conclusion that because because everything has been reduced to a win or a loss in terms of the two political parties, that persuasion, the power of persuasion has been lost. You, you, the, the, even, if, even if the Democrats agreed with something that the Republicans wanted to do, given the, if it's not the right season for compromise, they're never going to go along with it because it would appear to be a loss. Same thing with the Republicans to the Democrats. And we, if we can't get away from that, we can't solve our problems. Because you, as you said, we can't get everything that we want with conviction discussions. There has to be an ability to work together on areas we can agree. Okay, so Tony, you said before, the, before our first program off the air, and I don't think I'm saying anything out of school, you said, you said that I believe in absolute truth. And you seem like a reasonable guy. You believe in absolute truth, but how do you apply grace that maybe Judy doesn't subscribe to your absolute truth? Well, look, my role is as a, as a believer, as, as a person, uh, I feel like a person of faith, is to share my convictions about the things that I believe <coughs> with Judy. And then Judy's role is to take that and you know, under God's grace to decide one way or the other where to receive or reject. And But we need to, once we, if, if we need to be able to have a relationship where 
I agree that there are some things that she's going to share with me that I'm not going to receive very well, but I'll consider. And she needs to do the same thing. Because we have a relationship, she should genuinely be interested in the things that I believe and have to say. And if we can ever get those things kind of deal with them and then find the areas of agreement, then we can work together with respect where, where she's not afraid that I'm always going to be pushing mm -hmm. and she and I'm not afraid that she's always going to be saying that well you're a right wing whatever so, I mean, so, go ahead. so <laughs> maybe the standards by which someone wins a political debate should be we should have an, a newscast create our own newscast where we evaluate the debate and we have a common <laughs> ground evaluation who is the best at creating the common ground that will enable our country to move forward most solidly and most effectively and we should maybe set a new standard because society is clearly not setting the standards. What sells in the media, you know, are those explosive lines and those controversial issues and, right. and those religious areas mm -hmm. of dogma. Yeah. You know, and we, we need to say that's not what makes us a successful country. And what makes us a su successful country is when our politicians can work together um, to come out with positive outcomes of very, very difficult decisions, right? We have we don't have endless resources and we have to decide how we're going to allocate those resources and there are lots of goods uh, between which we need to struggle. So so here's the thing then. We've got we've got a, a, I would guess and Doug you'll know this probably, but we've got a majority of the people that would love to have those that are additive and more conveners than they are polarizing. So if, if we assume that most of the uh, constituents want that, what is the disconnect between what we have and what we want? I, um, maybe most of the constituents want that. Uh, they say that part of the time. I also think that a lot of people live in, this is a great place to say it, in a media world with a lot of electronic possibilities. <laughs> How often they are actually in deep conversations with other people in their own neighborhood, that you can probably count up on one, on one hand. How often they flip on the TV or listen to the radio or tune in MSNBC or something, that's probably pretty frequent. What I worry about is that they're not getting enough practice talking to actual human beings mm -hmm. and instead what they're getting is a bunch of segmented media articulations of basic convictions aimed at particular audiences to get market share and that doesn't really make for conversation I think in some ways so I worry that in some respects uh, the American people are, are less and less in touch with a kind of search for common mm -hmm. ground in political discussions and I think they would do them a good turn to be more in touch with it I believe they have great abilities I have great faith in my fellow Americans but I wish they would talk to each other some more. So do you think we have exactly what we deserve? Now that's an interesting line. I, <laughs> I, at, least, I at least think that sometimes we get more or less what we deserve. Now what I hope for is in addition to that is some grace. And grace, of course, by definition, is not what people deserve. Mm -hmm. It's what they get gratuitously. And I, I, think, I think that's a good thing. I come from a grace alone tradition, so I have hope. I come from a grace alone tradition. Our only dogma is you're saved by grace alone. It doesn't really mm -hmm. matter how you articulate your theology and so forth. That's good old Calvinism for you. But not everyone shares that. But I mean, on, that, on, the, on those grounds, you can have conversations with lots of people without trying to make them change their mind to agree with you. You, you were going to say something? Yeah, I, I think the same thing could be said across the uh, population, couldn't it, because of the internet and tweeting. I mean, we're not talking about, you'll see couples at the restaurants sometimes not even talking to each other, they're texting each other. Uh, or texting somebody else. Yeah, and, and so uh, the media, uh, the technology, has interfered with the relationship building that we see is the culprit behind a lot of the, the dogma and the uh, splintering that we see politically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can't do in a soundbite world what we're trying to achieve here. No. It's absolutely impossible. You can't take a segment of what somebody has said or and, and magnify it through a bullhorn and, and create a policy out of it. There has to be context and there has to be the ability, like you said, talk to each other, build a relationship. You know, and I think you made the point earlier, if, if I know you, if I get to know you, even the connection that we've come across, we're sure. both from Rutherford County. <laughs> we share, there's a lot of things that we share in that. And that can be explored as we de develop a relationship of trust where then we can begin to talk to each other without being antagonistic. I guess. Is the way you know, I recently took a flight from New York and I was sitting next to a uh, conservative Christian. He had no idea who I am or how liberal I am. And I really, and he actually didn't care to 
inquire, <laughs> but, but it was okay because I said, you know, when you go to the polls, what issues are you voting on? What worries you? What are you thinking about? And I could spend the whole flight learning what he cared about. And I know that I'm going to be a lot better on my next panel, on my next dialogue. And, and he, he raised some good issues that I need to struggle with. Okay, could what he's saying work? To ha have we tried that before? You know, what are the possibilities? So because that polarization sells, right? And we're, we're going to the lowest common denominator mm -hmm. with our media and sound bites and all that. We, as religious leaders, it's our job to lift it up and say that's not good enough. You know, let's not let our minds melt down to nothing and, and, and sort of sit where we are comfortable and listen and learn from places where mm -hmm. we're comfortable. Let's challenge ourselves to make a stronger so, country. So, so, I mean, you both said the same, well, you've all said the same thing. Pat, what does it, I mean, what does it look like? What is it, what do you do in Greenville, South Carolina, to raise the dialogue so it's not down at the lowest common denominator, but it's still understandable by everyone? Well, Chris, I think I want to answer a different question. Uh, that's quite a political tradition. Politician? Yeah, it's quite, it's quite <laughs> a political uh, tradition in this country. But I, I do want to mention that there is a movement afoot in the country now called No Labels. And it's a, it's a website. 500,000 people have put this thing together, Democrats and Republicans. And they're looking for common ground. They're looking for things that they can agree on. One of the things they've agreed on is that Congress ought to pass a budget every year. Uh, apparently, the U.S. Senate has not approved a budget in over three years. Mm -hmm. so, so they're agreeing on that. They're agreeing on uh, containing congressional pay, uh, trying to keep congressional pay um, somewhat under control. Uh, it, they're, they're looking for issues that a lot of people can agree on, and it is an organization of both Republicans and Democrats, so I want to shill for them just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, no labels. I think it's nolabels.com, but it may be nolabels.org. I'm not sure. But to get back to your question, I, I think what we do is we serve. Service is universal in its appeal. It, it appeals to conservatives, it appeals to liberals, it appeals to people who uh, don't have any political opinions. When you're, when you're working in a homeless shelter, when you're building affordable housing through uh, various organizations, when you're doing that kind of work, when you're reaching out to the powerless that Bill really started the whole conversation with, when you're doing that kind of work, you are appealing to universal themes. And, and you're going to have somebody working beside you who probably disagrees with everything you believe politically, but understands that, that service is universal. Just, but, but we're so good as faith communities, as feeding the hungry and housing the homeless, but that's not going to end homelessness, right? Right, exactly. It's going to take policy. It's going to take a commitment, yes. right? There are, and it's going to take the economic arguments and all of us working together to say we will do it and we can do it. So it's okay. not enough just to sit and serve the hungry and do what the community expects the faith community to do, and we will do it. With, with smiles and with grace and honor the dignity of the individuals, but we have to be involved in the political realm, right? Mm -hmm. We have to look at policy in order to create the change that will have less hungry and homeless and, on our streets. And hold, hold on, Tony, because I want to bring up this whole idea about service. I mean, many, many people that, at least some of the circles that I've been talking in leading up to this dialogue, we've done some background work, I've done some reading, and I, I heard more than once that, they, that many people who go to church or go to synagogue are more, are more concerned or as concerned that churches have become a path to significance and not a path to service. So Bill, as a, um, as a, as a leadership in faith, how do you make sure that people you know, you move to the South, and one of the first questions you get is, "What what church, what church are you? you to, yeah, what right? church are you going to?" I think it's um, again we're going back to who you are, your identity, which comes out of your faith stance, and in that identity, how, how do you live? And part of that is a service component where you're giving back to the community. I also think that it's important, and, and perhaps going back to your original thought about public conscience that the church has the, or the congregation has the best influence on uh, forming pu public policy and the policies that will affect the community through the relationships that are built, built within that community. Sitting in our congregations oftentimes are the power brokers of the community. And we can dialogue with them outside of the pulpit and, and through a relationship begin to weave some of the patterns and the relationships that will build the things we need in the community. How do you keep the politics out of the church? How do you do it? You don't. You don't. I don't I mean, mean the difference, Pat. I don't mean the difference between church and state. I, I'm talking about how do you make sure that the sanctuary, that the temple is the safe place to sit, and and there is not a sense of politics there, but still you 
to, to, maybe I'm getting way off on it, but how, how do you do that? Preach scripture. Well, I, I don't, are you, are you talking about politics as it relates to the public arena or the politics that goes on inside the walls of the church? Well, I think I mean, I'm referring to the for, the, the, the latter for, there. So, it right. may, and maybe that's not fair to, to go in, in. So let me bring it back. You don't even have to answer that question. Let, let me take that one back off the table. Um, the, 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 all right, so how do you get, you both said service. How, does, how, does, how do you get service more at the center of the DNA to bring people together then? How do we bring people together through service? Well, we have to trust, we, we have to develop a level of trust with each other so that we can work together. And then as we serve together, we start to come up with true solutions, I think, to the problems that we face. Nobody want, I don't want hungry, hungry people. Do you want hungry people? You don't want hungry people, right? I don't want any hungry people. The question is not, do we agree that we, don't, we, we should not have hungry people in a, in a land as prosperous as this? The question is, how do we end hunger? How do we address the problem of hunger? That's where we're going to end up with disagreements and the, the, the policy. Let's go back to what Doug has said, back, back to the policy, what we actually can hammer out together. And I think that the answer to that begins with the relationship that we develop between each other, the trust that we develop with, between each other, agree that we want to see hunger come to an end, and then as we trust each other, we can begin to throw out ideas and, and become open and not afraid to discuss what we think could be a possible solution. You were open to some of the things that the conservative Christians sat next to you. I mean, for a while, you, you opened it, you said, yes, open up. I, I think that's key. Uh, for right. getting and it done. Our issue is not that my congregants aren't open to service. They are. There are just so many areas of service that mm -hmm. need to be done and you can get lost. So you really have to focus your work, right? Education, poverty, hunger, homelessness, so that you can go deep and really create change. And then there's when we work together with other religious institutions, and that's where we come together as Mecklenburg Ministries. And we had 300 clergy at a faith summit two Fridays ago where we said, you know what, we can and we will do this. And we all have to drive to our 10-year plan to end and prevent homelessness in Charlotte, Mecklenburg. So, so maybe then, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with whether you uh, have Calvinistic tendencies or Methodist or Jewish right. or, I mean, maybe it has everything to do, and how many times have you all said relationship? Maybe it has everything mm -hmm. to do with the grace that we show each other. It is that really what does. it is? Absolutely. Well, I, I Plain and simple and throw the dogma out the window? Well, 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 I'm not throwing it. Well, I'm, <laughs> sorry, I'm not give it. No, that, that I'm wasn't the right thing to say. Business, but, Chris, don't do that. But, 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 <laughs> but it is the case, right, that religious people who have varied convictions have significant overlaps in their convictions. It is the case that they can respect one another. It is the case that other persons who are not religious can too. And it is the case that they can learn by being involved in common cooperative projects in some detail with one another, right. and learn that the other person doesn't have a tail and stuff like that, and that you can cooperate operate and you can talk over deeply held convictions as well as talk about policies. It can be done. It can be done in a congregation. It can be done in Little League soccer. You can do a lot of different ways, but go cooperate with somebody who's not exactly like you. Get to know them and see where it takes you. That would be one positive step and there are other things to do too. Mm -hmm. Any other comment on that? I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. I, I think it does come down to relations because, relationships because again, I, if, if we don't trust each other, I mean, the, the anxiety, a little bit of anxiety mm -hmm. I felt driving up 85 to get here, wondering what this was going to be like, wondering about the people that I was going to meet, how different we're going to be. You, you have to overcome that with relationship and trust before you have an opportunity to solve problems. But disagreements are great. Yeah, you know, it would be are. scary if we all agreed and mm -hmm. uh, then we wouldn't be moving forward and really thinking about the, the ethical values on which we're grounding our decisions. So I liken Charlotte to a quilt, right? We're all different fabrics of beliefs and backgrounds and places from where we're born mm -hmm. and have come and the histories we bring to this moment and we are beautiful quilts and and the collaboration the finding common ground is the the, the thread that ties us together to create a strong fabric of our community and so right. we need to debate and we need to dialogue in respectful ways so that we can grow and come up with the best solution for if we don't we're not going to move the ball forward in solving these critical issues in our community. You know, Rabbi Schindler, we started with you and we're going to end with you. That's, that's, the, that's the last word. And we end on hope. Pat, you wanted to end on hope. We ended on hope, and I think that's a good way to go. Uh, gentlemen, lady, uh, it's awfully nice to have you all here. And thanks for toughing it out, Tony, for driving all the way up there, Pat. Uh, good to see you all. Doug, thanks. Thank Bill, you. Judy, thanks. until next week, good night.
Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton an international accounting tax and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.